to uh, speak to you speak to you about product management. Um, I actually live out of Chicago, so right now it's 2 p.m. over where I'm living, uh, but I'm very happy to help uh, present and talk a little bit about um, my experience in product management and how I can help you guys understand a little bit more about it. So the agenda today I have for today is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background to kind of help expose to you guys the various different types of products that one could manage through looking at it through my career and like the kind of products I've managed myself. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the typical day of a product manager. Um, I'll explain a little bit of the nuances in, of each day um, in, a, in a, you know, busy week for, for a product manager. Um, I'll also explain a little bit about what is what I consider amazing about product management, uh, subjective, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit about why I wake up every morning excited to work on things, even when it's hard and challenging. Um, and also the uh, four major phases of the product life, life cycle, and then I'll be able to provide some context around that as well. Um, and at the very end, I'll also allow some time for some Q&A and some questions based on anything I, I bring up in the conversation. So currently I'm a senior product manager at a Boston Consulting Group. Uh, I am working out of their digital ventures division. Uh, so Boston Consulting Group is known as a traditional strategy consulting company. They're like ranked number two in the world. However, uh, the digital ventures team, we help uh, build these startups and these products for Fortune 500 companies that uh, work with BCG to, to help uh, not only the strategy, but to actually launch these uh, startups and companies and products. Uh, so I'll go over some of the companies that I've worked at before. So prior to BCG, I worked at a company called Fetch Rewards. Uh, the product is one in which you scan receipts, you get points, um, and then you use those points for Amazon gift cards. And so the business model there is uh, brands uh, get featured, they pay to get featured on the app. Um, and then as you scan points from those products and brands, um, the users get more points and ultimately uh, people buy more of those products, which then is what the brands are, are hoping for is that people uh, will use their products more as a result of being part of the Fetch Rewards points program. Uh, I also worked at a company called Level X. It's a unique company. Uh, it's uh, video games for doctors. Um, so we have some mobile apps in the in that Play Store and App Store uh, for doctors to be able to practice these very unique uh, case studies and patient uh, scenarios that they usually don't have access to. Um, and then also I helped launch a, a cloud gaming platform so that uh, this happened during COVID. A lot of pharma sales reps or med device sales reps used to knock on the doors of doctor's offices and explain to them what products that they have available for them to use in their next patient. Um, and so we created a platform so that they can do that remotely using game technology, multiplayer technology. Um, and as you can see here, we got some hyper-realistic um, medical scenarios. Like this is a, a total knee surgery. This is in 3D, but it looks very realistic. And that's part of what we did in the, in the gaming studio is to make those hyper-realistic experiences. I also worked for uh, Cooler Screens. Um, so Cooler Screens um, is launching nationwide as of last year, I believe, mid last year. Um, I helped launch the first 50 stores. Uh, we replaced the glass doors of the cooler aisles of Walgreens stores, uh, which is where you have all the frozen foods and beverages um, and placed them with digital screens. And now like brands and even Walgreens themselves can promote products and also change the prices digitally as opposed to doing it all manage, man, manually with stickers or cardboard uh, you know, pictures or, or um, changing the price stickers as well on every single product. Now it can be changed uh, digitally as well. And this was the first product I ever worked on. There were two products. One was a tablet um, for patients in the exam room for them to watch educational videos about uh, various health topics uh, before the doctor walks in. We tailored those, those uh, devices to have content associated with the clinic. So if a clinic had mostly cardiologists, you would see a lot of cardiology content. Um, or if you saw a lot, you had a lot of uh, diabetic patients, you would see a lot of uh, di different types of, you know, health and nutrition about diabetes type of content on those videos. And then if you see here at the top, we also uh, helped launch a, a product called the wall board, which was mounted on the uh, wall. We still have these across the country. Um, and a doctor would select a, you know, anatomical body part, and then it would show it in big screen on, a, on that 32 inch touch screen, and they can rotate or draw on it um, and to help their conversation with their patients. So as you can see, I kind of gone back and forth between healthcare and retail. Um, and now that I'm at BCG, I hope to work in other industries. 
So that's a little bit about me and what I've worked on in the past. I'll take, talk a little bit about the typical day of a product manager. Um, so here I have it broken down like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And the way I decided I want to explain this is like, this is a typical, typical week close to launching a new product. And the reason why I, I explain that is because there's different phases of a product, which I'll explain at the very end. Um, but typically, like when, when a company is hiring a product manager, um, they're likely trying to launch something new, uh, whether it's a net new product, like, like from scratch, never had it before, or new features, uh, and usually like big major releases that will make a, a major difference to the company or the product. And so here, I'll start off with like the Monday. If you notice here, every single day, there's a morning standup. So I talk to the team every single morning, uh, first thing in the morning. Um, and that's very important as a product manager, because no matter how much of a plan you have, um, the process of product, of del product development, engineering, design, it's all like building, like, like, or, like incrementally. And so with that process, any given day, whatever you thought was going to work may not work, right? And so part of what, what your role is as a product manager is you need to find out what the status is. And this is less of a project management task because project managers might think, oh yeah, I can you know, just start up the day and ask everybody what they're doing. But like, as a product manager, you're not just trying to make sure everybody's doing what their job is. Something is likely going wrong. Something is likely not uh, exactly as planned. And then you need to find that out first thing in the morning so that you, you pivot your day to that, right? So ideally, you, know, you plan out for the week, um, the Friday before, um, and then Monday morning, everybody knows what they're going to get start working on. But then somebody says, hey, I thought this was a thing we we're going to do, but no, it's no longer the thing. And I don't know what to do. Now you have to spend your day fixing that, right? Regardless of what you had planned. And so that's what you are as a product manager is adapting and adjusting to any of the issues that come up from engineering and design or the business um, as, a, as a whole. And the start, the standup is an important piece of that. Now, uh, the thing that I like to do on my, on my Mondays as well is I like to remind the team what, of the priorities and goals. And this isn't for the week, by the way, like the priorities of goals of the product, right? So you need to, as a product manager, remind people that uh, designers and engineers and even some support people or marketing people, they're very tactical and they're focused on like what I'm doing now and what I'm going to give you tomorrow. But it's very important to remind the team of the priorities and goals of the product in the long term, right? So this is week two of something that you're planning to launch maybe in like two, three months from now. And so when you remind people the end goals, it helps them plan and prepare and also communicate to you of, of issues or, or missing pieces that are, still have not been figured out. Um, and that's why I do it first thing in Monday because then if I need to schedule meetings with say leadership or users or with the engineering team, I, I pivot my week based on the feedback I get from that Monday. Uh, like priority and goal meeting. Then I identify blockers and issues, which is what the standup and the priority and goals ex example is. There should be ideally like no issues, but when issues come up, you are the quarterback. You are the person responsible for making sure that those things get addressed. And yet, yet you are not the engineer, you are not the designer and nobody reports to you, but you are supposed to be the person that connects the dots and follows up, makes sure that the right people are talk to each other to figure things out. Or worst case scenario, you start talking about pivoting a plan. Then uh, I would schedule user interviews. Um, typically throughout the life cycle of a product, um, you're constantly in touch with users, whether you just launched a product or feature um, and you want to see how it's resonating. Um, you could do that with data, but I personally like to do 50-50. You can you know, quantitatively just see the engagement of a product through the analytics. However, um, the other half of the, of the process is hearing about why people like it or why people don't like whatever features you just launched. Um, and so simultaneously, the user interviews also are for features you have not launched yet. So you might be showing uh, mock-ups or clickable prototypes of an upcoming feature or product, and people will be able to give you feedback before you build it. And this will inform you and the designer and the engineering team about what features need to be uh, prioritized next. Then uh, you know, discuss unit economics with finance, right? So there's an aspect of a product manager does not only work with designers and engineers, you're also working with the business cohorts, right? So uh, you're gonna be talking to the finance team, 
Um, it might be a team of one, it might be a team of five, 20, depends on the size of the company. Um, but the unit economics is very important because this is how you are breaking down. Like, for example, when I worked on the cloud gaming platform, you know, there's this, it's a streaming platform. And when you're not a company like Google or Netflix and you're streaming live video, not like video files are being downloaded to a device, but it's a stream of a live video interaction that people are touching. Um, that streaming um, functionality on the back end costs money by the minute and by the hour and by the user. And so the unit economics is the process in which I'm breaking down uh, how much it will cost the business um, to function the product based on how we're scope we spec it out. Um, and then it will be like on a per user per month or per you know hour basis of using the product. Um, in that case, that's how we broke it down. It was per hour by number of users. Um, and then that let you know sales and finance know, decide on their end what the pricing is. As a product manager, I rarely determine what the pricing is. I just inform the cost of operations for what my product so that they know just like what margin they want. Um, and if something is gonna give a customer a sticker shock and they're not, they're gonna say it's too expensive, um, it's on them to manage, but at least they know how to make sure that we keep the lights on and we don't accidentally cost the, the business money that we not, are not making a margin or revenue on. So then uh, that's an example of like a Monday, then on a Tuesday, um, you know, at morning standup, then I meet with the designer about user interviews, right? So if I did, have these user interviews, schedule a few. I'm likely having them with my designer. So both my designer and I are in that meeting talking to these end users back and forth. Uh, I let the designers manage the whole thing, but sometimes you get a piece of information from a user that you were not expecting and the designer doesn't know what you're you know, thinking about on behalf of the business. And so I sometimes interject and ask questions and then let the designer you know, take back control of the meeting. Um, and so what I like to do is talk to them the next day in granular detail and say, hey, what do you think about the interviews? Did you, did you get any insights to change the design? By the way, this feedback point I just got is a great thing to you know, reference back to leadership on something they were thinking about or the opposite. Leadership might be saying, you know, I think users are going to blah, 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 ABC. And then you find out it's X, Y, Z. It's actually the opposite. And leadership actually expects you to be the leader that comes back, even with the bad news, right? And But like instead of just coming with the bad news and just saying, by the way, users don't like this, you are supposed to be the person that comes back with an alternative plan as well on top of that. So when you come back with the bad news to leadership, you also need to provide them the alternative option of what the plan could and should be based on these insights. And the scenario for me, usually if it's bad news and the users are giving feedback that's negative and not resonating with what you and the leadership team thought originally. I come back with that alternative, you know, one, two, three options of pivoting potentially, or leadership might say, I think they're wrong, let's still move forward. And you, you have that dialogue. So you may not always do what the users ask for because of business reasons, right? There may be a client that's, that paid already up front to launch a feature. And so whether or not users like it in day one is a different story than launching it on time because they already paid for it. So there's all these dynamics you always have to think about in product management. And I'll explain a little bit about that, more of that later on as well. Then I'll review like QA test results, right? So you constantly have QA engineers or the engineers themselves are doing the QA testing for features. I always like to assume things are gonna go wrong. And so I actually invest dedicated time to see what those results are talk to the QA team, find out, hey, what are the issues? What are, you, the, what are you, the U flows that you're going wrong? Um, and then I'll discuss blockers with the dev team, right? So if I identify blockers and issues on Monday, maybe I, don't, I won't want to address them because they're not that urgent on that day. But then the next day, I'll go ahead and start talking about those with the dev team. And usually it's dev related. I mean, there are blockers on the design side, but usually designers can unblock themselves by either talking to more users or doing more research on other apps that do similar behavior. Um, but usually with the engineering team, that's when uh, the conversations are multiple hours sometimes. Uh, if an issue comes up and it's gonna pivot the way a design or feature works and you're running out of time, um, you're gonna have to get creative and go back and forth with the engineer about alternative solutions to what you originally thought. And then as a, as a uh, uh, product manager, you're quarterbacking those those changes, and then when you if you do make a change that people nobody expected, you have the full story because you talk to the engineering team for multiple hours 
about why you made that decision. And so if anybody questions you or pushes back, um, you have full context to explain that. Um, and then also, whoops, and then also uh, I'll meet with the stakeholders, right? So uh, there may be some, some teams within the company that are re really reliant on you to launch a new feature or a product. Um, in particular, like sales teams in the sales organization, they might be, their, their goal is to, you know, sell more of your product or make, get more clients up to buy the product. And maybe that one feature you're working on right now is, is the one that they're waiting for in order to like 2X or 3X their current sales revenue, right? So with that said, you need to talk to them on a weekly basis about the progress. If you have some mock-ups, some screenshots, you wanna show them and have the dialogue and explain to them, hey, don't show this to clients yet because it might change, but this is the progress we're making. What are your thoughts? This is unique to me, by the way. A lot of product managers don't have this style. Um, typically in the industry, there's a lot of friction between product and sales because sales says, product doesn't know what the users want. I talk to the users I know. And then product says like, oh, but you don't know how to build, you know, engineering products. It's hard to do that. It's not as easy as flipping a switch on. And so usually that's the friction you experience in a lot of organizations. Typically, it's just a typical thing. It's not everywhere. Um, but I actually like to pull them in. I like to say, this is what I'm doing. And I start with the trust. And I say, don't share these screens. Don't, don't talk about these too soon because I might change some of these features but let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know if you think this will work. Why or why not? What are your objections from customers? Am I still solving the problem from what you see here? Um, and I like to do that on a weekly basis. Then we'll move on to Wednesday. Uh, I'll do the stand up again. I'll write some user stories, right? So at this point, based on Monday and Tuesday, I should have enough information to start writing down some of these features, what the user story should be, uh, you know, as a I need so that format uh, for the user story. And then in that same ticket, I write acceptance criteria. Um, I like to write it in a format called Gherkin format. And so given when then is the format of all of the functionality um, and the triggers of said functionality, this helps the engineering team and the QA team um, better understand what you're trying to build and why and what the triggers are. And the sequence of events and the dependencies in between. Um, so I like to use Gherkin acceptance criteria for that very reason. Then uh, I'll start drafting OKRs. I may already have some drafted and I'm just like figuring it out and validating through the user interviews and talking with engineering, um, or I will start drafting those OKRs. Actually last week I wrote some OKRs on a product based on the analysis that the, that the BCG team had done before I joined the, the team uh, for that product. Um, so OKRs is a framework, you can look it up. Um, it's an easy way to, to organize your goals and how you're gonna achieve those goals in a measurable way. Um, so the OKRs is a very popular format from Google um, and it's very, very popular among a lot of startups as well. And a lot of executive leaders are now familiar with OKRs and it's a good way to talk about what you're working on, what your goals are and the long-term strategy um, using OKRs. And then um, I'll assess the product based on user interviews. I mentioned this earlier, but I'll do this in private um, after I have the conversation with design and engineering. Um, I'll review the UX design. Um, something I like to also remind people is there is a difference uh, of, a, of what a UX designer does. The UX designer does the research. Now, some companies make that same designer do the UI. Other companies will have a whole separate designer do the UI. So you have a UX designer and a UI designer. And some companies just do both. And you have a talented person that can do both. Um, and so those usually are the startups, the smaller companies will have both in one. Um, and so what I like to do is I like to review the UX design of any actual UI elements that the, that the designer created. Um, and then this is where I'll have back and forth conversations, similar to the conversation with engineering, um, maybe multiple hours going back and forth on the intricacies of the flow and the user journey and how everything like looks and functions and how it feels. Um, and then I'll meet with marketing stakeholders. So if you're about to launch a product, marketing is, is simultaneously parallel path to you and the engineering team and design team is building collateral. They're thinking about how to go on social media. Are you going to send emails? Are you going to you know, actually put billboards across the city, it depends on your product, right? Um, and so they have a whole project plan that they're executing on 
simultaneously that you are you are not directly a part of, but they rely on you because they need information from you. They need to know what the product's gonna look like. When is it launching? What are the features that are actually gonna be there? Did you cancel any features because they need to remove that from all of their drafts of emails and social media marketing. Um, and so you're got, you have to be in very close contact with marketing in order to make your product successful. Many, many companies make the mistake of thinking that the product itself is gonna sell itself. And this is 100% false. You need to have a marketing team that is going to support the launch of your product because your product could be super amazing, but if you don't have the right marketing team, it's gonna flop. And so it needs to be a collaboration between product and marketing in order for the, for the product to be successful or the launch of a feature. Um, and then say Thursday, uh, there's a morning stand up again. Uh, I'll review UX with engineering. Um, the, there's an important aspect of making sure that you you pull in the engineering team to the to early phases of design, right? So if, if you and the designer early in the week talk to some users, started talking about some you know the UX design, how the UI should be, um, and then you came to a consensus. Now you should be at a point where you can talk to the engineering team. This meeting is very critical because you and your designer can be like, oh, these apps do it this way. We followed best practices. And the engineer, you might have an engineer that's green, very new, um, it does not know all the bells and whistles of how to get everything done, is potentially learning on the job. Um, and when you work with somebody like that, you may have to compromise and pull back on certain things. They might say, I cannot build that, or, it's or it's, I can build it, but it's gonna take me X amount of time. And you may not have the luxury to wait that amount of time. And so when you collaborate with the engineering team about the UX or UI, it's a, it's a very, it could be a very painful dialogue. And what I mean by painful is, like I said, depending on the seniority of the engineering team, they may tell you, no, we can't do this for ABC reasons. And as a product manager, you need to be the person that actually drills into A, B, and C, D, and all of, all of the details, you drill into it not question, because you also don't want to be condescending to the person. Like if you got to trust the engineer that if there's an issue that comes up, it's, it's legitimately because they, they think that there's going to be problems or they, they know it's going to take a long time. Trust them on that, but don't skip the process of talking to them about the detail. And this is where the technical mindset comes in when you're working with an engineering team is you can't, they can't just say, oh, I can't do that. It's going to take two months. And you just take their word for it. As a product manager, you need to be the person that asks like, oh, what about it takes two months? And then, and then you talk it out detail by detail. And they, there may, they may sell you something that's above your head. They may not. Um, nine times out of 10, it's not the technical detail that catches people up. Sometimes engineers make assumptions that are not true and they think they're gonna build a functionality that they misunderstood. And then when you have that dialogue, all of a sudden the scope that they said was gonna take two months was like, oh, if it's like that, that's two weeks. And you need to have, take the time to have that dialogue. Getting to that consensus of from two months to two weeks because of a mis misunderstanding can take anywhere from a 20 minute conversation to a four hour back and forth dialogue over two days, right? So, so it varies, but you are the person responsible for that dialogue. Um, and the next, uh, so keep drafting the OKRs keep updating the user stories. This is, you know, this is Thursday. So this is with the intent of next week, right? Monday, there's more work to do. Like, so when you work on a, on a, on a product team, you're usually working in one or two week sprints. Uh, I'm using like a, like, I'm assuming this is the second week of a sprint and you're about to start a new one on Monday. So you need to have all your work basically done on Thursday and then Friday is polishing up. So you're the person that's ahead of the team. Right? You're ahead of the team by a week because you're already doing research, having all the details, getting all the requirements done by that Thursday before the next sprint. And then by Friday, um, so here's plan for the next sprint and then review the, the dev and design progress for the current week. And then on Friday, you're meeting with support stakeholders, you're updating your roadmap, and then you're finalizing your user stories and you're sending a weekly recap to the leadership team. Right, So Friday is like your, okay, this is what's happened thus far. These are the issues that were identified. This is what we're doing about those issues. This is the work that's lined up for next week. And you're sending this information to leadership. This may be in a meeting format. This may be a presentation you're doing. This may be an email. Some companies just say, hey, send, send the leadership team. There's a distribution list. Send it to leadership at blah, blah, blah.com. 
and that will be what we expect. And then we'll tell you if we want a full meeting uh, to drive into any of those details. So the Friday is where you're recapping your week and then planning for the next one. So one of the other topics that came up was uh, what is amazing about product management? Um, so for me, in my, in my perspective, is the collaborative grind. Um, so I, I have here successful products don't come easy, nor overnight or without a fully dedicated team. Um, this is an aspect that I think a lot of books and a lot of reading material skips, or it's not directly clear that the, the product development process and as a product manager, you are there through thick and thin. And if it, if it starts going wrong, that's when you do more work. You are not one of the people on the team that gets to just like pull back and say, oh, somebody else will figure it out. You were hired as a person that's gonna figure it out. Um, and so you need to do whatever you have to do to make the product successful. Um, and, and you are not the implementer, but you are the person that knows the most knowledge out of everyone in the company about why something is going to be successful or not. Um, and how hard it is going to be to build and what some of those challenges are and whether or not the users or market even care about it, right? So all those details, you are in the rare position as a product manager of understanding all of those details. And so if something's going wrong, you should have the most insight on how to solve that problem. And people are hiring you to be able to make sure you can figure that out. Um, and I know I'm talking a little bit, a lot about the negative process of what happens in product management. I think but I, I like to show like students like this in this class and talk about these details because as glamorous as product management may feel when products go successful, there's a lot of hard work and you need to work with your team on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not something where you just do off a spreadsheet. You need to actually talk to everyone. And nine times out of 10, every single feature has a nuance that you need to talk to with your team and figure it out. But that's what I enjoy it, actually. I personally like the fact that Things can go wrong and I, I trust the talent of my team to, to talk to me and figure it out with me. Um, and then we can all come back to another plan that will work for the business. And that's what I like the most about um, product management. Another thing I like about product management and what I think is awesome is that it makes really good use of, of T-shaped people. And this is a, a, an explanation I have right here is a T-shaped person has deep knowledge skills in one area and a broad base of general supporting knowledge skills, right? So the, the T, the top of the T is like, you can go broad. And this is where it's like engineering, design, marketing, sales, finance. You need to understand everything broadly. But if the moment that somebody needs some help or somebody needs detail, you need to be able to go deep real quick on any of those areas at any given time, right? So even though I have that calendar and I'm like, oh, I talked to design, on Tuesday and marketing, it's, it's not always based on my plan. It's based on the needs of the company. So somebody in marketing might need me first thing in the morning on Monday, and I'll tell them, hey, I'm going to have a stand up and then I'll talk to you. And I could have been planning to have user interviews, but guess what? If there's a major issue and we're finding out the product is losing money for some whatever reason, I am canceling those user interviews, right? And I need to be able to dive deep into the financial or sales side of things as necessary when it comes up. Um, and so that's where the T-shaped person concept comes in. And I think this, this is an awesome aspect for those that really have interest in all those areas, like myself, um, being able to, to use your, your skills in that manner. With the T-shaped skills, that's where uh, this very popular diagram comes in, right? There's UX tech business, you are in the center of it. You're quarterbacking it. And something that I like to explain to a lot of people is that, you know, being a product manager, like is being like the CEO of the product. There's one nuance about that statement. Nobody reports to you and you don't, and, and you, nobody reports to you and you don't have any direct reports. As a result, you don't have any actual authority over anyone. You have influence, right? So because of the fact that you talk to users, you talk to finance, you talk to sales, you go out of your way, figure out the implementation details of engineering and design, you have the most knowledge. And so people will gravitate to your plan because they, they will see through your work that you understand more than they do as an individual contributor in a, in a very specific area. But nobody reports to you and you don't have authority over everyone, anyone. And so you're doing this through your process, through how you gather your information and how you share it and how you could do, go about your documentation. 
and also how you listen and pivot if necessary when things come up. And so the, the quarterbacking of the business is a cool part. It's a fun part of product management. It's usually, this is part, this is the reason why most people start enjoying product management. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, UX is not UI. It includes research and deep empathy for the users. You get direct exposure to details that don't, that matter or that don't matter, right? So when you talk to users, you might find out, you know, whatever they're, they're talking about is stuff you already know, but then you talk to the next user and half the conversation is brand new stuff that you didn't know about and now you're learning as well. Um, and then you get to determine if the business hypothesis is right or wrong while you're talking to users and getting that feedback loop. Then there's that UI aspect, right? You get informed by UX. I think this is the easiest part because uh, designing uh, a product there's already a lot of best practices. There's a lot of examples of existing apps. There's thousands of apps in the app store, websites, millions of websites and apps. Um, so I, I consider this the easiest part, not in the tactical of designing, but as far as like, if there is a problem in, in UI, it's typically pretty easy to, to find out how to solve for it. You rarely come across um, never before seen problems in the UI side of things. Um, and the part, this is also the UI is the part that users and the business most care about. So even though the whole week you had all of those conversations, you spent multiple hours on all this preparation, getting information back and forth, collaboration, at the end of the day, your deliverable is the UI, whether it's implemented UI or planned hypothetical, this is a UI plan that we have. And so you always have to keep that perspective is that people look at the output and they emphasize on that, but you need to know as a product manager, they don't know how much work is involved. That's why you were hired. You were hired because you're gonna be the person that cares. They may think you know, other details about how hard or easy it is to be a product manager, but the part that they usually care about, they being the business or the end users is the implementation of the UI. Um, then there's tech. Um, so the back end is just as important as the front end. Um, so if it's, Pretty cool if you have a nice looking app, and this happened to me actually just a year ago, your app could look great, the interface looks great, but your loading times are taking like five seconds every time you tap a, a button. And that's a backend thing, right? So the front end looks great, but the way the communication to the backend infrastructure is taking too long. So the backend is just as important as the front end. Um, then you co coordinate forks in the road as, uh, decisions. And that's what I, what I talk about um, when you talk to engineering teams, the engineers will, will say, hey, this." your plan or your recommendation and what we thought we could build for this feature um, can't work the, exactly the way you and the designer uh, initially described it based on how I can build this. The engineer will say, I can do it A, B, or C. Or sometimes they'll be like, I can only do A, but ideally you want A, B, or C alternative options. And you are the person that makes the final decision about whether you, you do A, B, or C, because you couldn't accomplish the original a goal, a design goal. And so those forks in the road, I, I actually have a lot of fun with that um, because there could be wrong choices, but then you need to ask the right questions. You need to go back to users, go back to stakeholders and figure out how to make the best deci informed decision, whether you were leveraging data or conversations with stakeholders or users. Then you get to creatively unblock the team. So everything I just described this whole time, um, it's all about listening. And, and then on the, on, as you get information, you are getting your entrepreneurial mindset coming and you're starting to figure out, okay, how can we overcome this problem even though I don't have all the resources that an Amazon or Google might have, right? Um, and so that creative unblocking of the team is a very, very fun aspect. Um, and I think that's what makes it very fun. Um, and this is also the hardest part. This, this text section is the hardest part because you're merging the business with the tech team and the UI, UX, and the roadmap. It's all merging during this process. Um, and as a result, that's, that's what makes it hard. Um, but as a result, you know, that's what makes it a lot high satisfaction as well. There's some aspects about tech. You want to avoid engineering with engin over engineering, uh, avoid over engineering. And what that means is when you over-engineer something, that means you created a scope that was complex, higher than what you actually needed, right? And so people forget this, but um, the original iPhone, if you go back to that iPhone one, 
and what features were there on that launch of that product. It didn't have much. People look at the iPhone and they're seeing the phone that has like 5,000 features on it, right? But when they launched the first version, it did not have those 5,000 features. Why? Because if Apple waited to build all these 5,000 features, they wouldn't have launched the phone until five years later. So there's this compromise that you need to make of iterative development and deciding what is good enough and just enough to satisfy the market so that you can launch on time. And the, the, the word over-engineering means you took too long and built more features than what it was worth waiting for. Um, and then you also want to avoid tech debt. So there's the alternative. If you cut corners and don't let the engineering team build the backend for scale, you launch the product, 100 users use it week one, and then two months later, marketing does their job, you get 10,000 users wanting to use the product, and then all of a sudden the backend can't support it and the app is crashing every five minutes. That's called tech debt when you cut corners and you didn't plan for scale. And so there's this balance, and it's hard for me to describe it in this conversation, but there is avoid over-engineering and avoid tech debt. And then you also don't let perf uh, perfection get in the way of progress. Um, and so that goes back to this, you know, over-engineering, right time in the market. Um, and then the, the QA collaboration, uh, you, you find bugs, then you got to pull in the engineer, you got to talk through what, what's happening. And I sometimes put on my QA hat on and I'll add myself as another resource as a QA team uh, to run any test scenarios or test cases in case that, QA team is, is getting getting full. Then there's the business aspect, right? So you, you impact the way the business earns money, usually. Um, so launching a new product or launching a new feature is going to unlock potential um, for the business model to expand and grow. Um, and so being able to be a part of that process is a unique way to learn how to manage or own a business. Um, and then you get to work with legal teams. I've worked in healthcare. A lot of the features that I worked with had to be reviewed and make sure that it was, you know, HIPAA compliant, which is to prevent the privacy of patient information to be exposed. And there's very specific details that need to be done in implementation in order for it to be approved in the healthcare space. There's also marketing collaboration, uh, which I mentioned earlier. The COGS analysis, this is, goes back to the unit economics. So the cost of good, cost of goods sold. It's a very um, well-known uh, acronym in the business, in the business industry. And this is, is goes back to what it costs to build the product, what it costs to maintain the product. And that's what you will include as part of what you charge people for at scale. Um, this goes back to the unit economics modeling. You don't always do this alone. So when I've done this, by the way, it's not always on me. I am informing the part of what costs um, are associated with building the product. I may have recommendations of what I think should be the price point should be, but I focus, I emphasize more on what the cost of the operations is, is going to be. Um, and then the roadmap feedback, right? So you're presenting a roadmap. People don't just clap uh, all the time. Sometimes there's scenarios where they have questions that they say, are you, are you sure about that feature? Like, can't we do that sooner? And that dialogue back and forth with leadership is really fun and engaging because everyone has very positive intent. Um, and so when you present your roadmap and people start asking questions, it's usually because they think there may be a better approach than what you've exposed thus far. And it's always great to have those conversations. All right, and so the last piece before I go to the Q&A um, is the four major phases of the product life cycle. Um, and so this is where, you know, we have introduction, growth, maturity, and decline, right? And you have this curve going here. And so typically when you, as a product manager, I came across this diagram, I didn't make this myself, um, you know, you, as an introduction phase, you know, you're trying to get product market fit. This is extremely hard here, the introduction, because you generally have a hypothesis of what you think customers and the market wants and what their pain points are and how you can solve it. The issue is you have fi a finite set of resources, usually, usually there are exceptions, but usually you have a finite set of resources as in you don't have six months to work with of funding to figure this out. You only have one engineer and no designer and you as a product manager need to do the, come up with the designs because you guys don't have enough money to scramble to get a designer to do the, the right kind of work, right? So there's a lot of risk here in this introduction. And so typically 
you don't hire brand new product managers into this introduction phase. Like you usually want somebody that's launched multiple products before uh, because this is a very unique phase. So what, like my experience doing this, uh, I did this for half of my products that I've managed. I helped during this introduction period. Um, and luckily the first product that I managed, there was already an established product for multiple years. And so that was funding the business. And so when I was going through this introduction, yes, we made some mistakes and some things didn't resonate, but we were able to pivot and adapt within the first six months and we did not lose funds and money to keep it going. And then we got to a point where we got revenue, right? So this introduction phase, usually you're not getting revenue and there's a lot of risk and you got to figure out how to get to a point of high growth usage or revenue or both. Um, then there's the growth phase. So this is the growth hacker, right? Expand, reach, scale, and stay competitive. This is where, okay, your product has already been established as viable. It has a means of staying afloat. Um, there is a user base that is interested, but you may have only a few hundred users or a few thousand users, and you wanna to get to a point of where you have like a hundred thousand users. That growth is not just on the marketing side, that's on the product feature development side as well. How do you choose which features to launch to get more people on the platform, right? When you think about even just Zoom, right? Zoom right now is the primary means in which everyone is meeting. However, for the last decade, there was Skype, right? So how did, did like Zoom overcome the Skype of the world? Skype already had millions of users for, for decades. But somehow they figured out how to do this growth model. There was product, they were product managers, product marketing managers, and product designers that were dedicated on the Zoom team to get to a point where we're all using this as a platform across the world, as opposed to Skype, which was already owned by Microsoft and been out in, this, in the market for a long time. Then you have the maturity, uh, the retention, sustaining, and market share. This is the, from my experience, um, this is where you start thinking enterprise, right? And so uh, a good example is Uber, right? Say Uber, they did the hyper growth, they did the growth hacking where they were able to like get a lot of, you know, regular everyday users to stop using taxis and start using Uber. At a certain point, Uber is just a primary means of where, how everybody's going about taxi, getting taxis, right? How do you expand that? Because eventually it's not just global expansion, which is usually a part of the maturity. You start expanding into other markets that don't, that you're not in yet. But the other aspect is, oh, so now Uber is going to start talking to big corporations, uh, say like a McDonald's, and they'll, they'll give a discount for partnering with McDonald's. And then McDonald's employees, when they travel, will use Uber exclusively through their work for their work travel, right? Now that's getting you no more revenue than you are just on everyday users, right? So usually this is what, you know, what's called the enterprise you know, scale of a product is you wanna support these big enterprises and they generally have very unique features that they need in order to do business with you. For example, BCG uh, has a partnership with Lyft and Uber. And so whenever I do travel on behalf of the business, I am going through either app, but in our business, we require that you use a code to track which project you are uh, using that taxi for. So that on the finance side, they know that. Guess what? They have a feature in Uber for BCG where when you select business class and then you, you select you want to do an Uber, they ask you for that code, for that project code. That's unique to BCG, right? So they, that's a feature built to expand and grow to this maturity phase of Uber and Lyft as an example. Um, and then there's the decline, right? So there's a certain point in which a product is just either um, it's another company is taking over using the example of Zoom and 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 Skype, right? Skype hit a point where it's it's still around, right? But it's dwindling down, right? And so, how do you pivot? How do you how do you dynamically change that? Because guess what? Microsoft owns Skype, but now Teams is the thing, right? So this is a, a, a dynamic in which they said, okay, this is gonna this is declining. It's a sunsetting, but now Teams is becoming the 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 new feature set, the new product that's gonna compete with you know the Zooms of the world. Right, so this is how you, a company starts thinking about strategically how do you change your product. Um, another example would be, you know, the the Apple had the iPods and they had music all over it, and then they launched the iPhones, and the iPhones also had music on it. Guess what? 
there's a point in which it interchanges and people are no longer buying iPods because they have the functionality on the iPhones. But guess what? Apple still makes money off of all of that, right? So that's a strategic approach of the decline of products and how you manage that whole scenario. All right, so uh, th that's my, my topics, talking through you know, the day in the life of product manager, what makes product management awesome, and the four phases of the product life cycle. Um, here's my email. Uh, this is my LinkedIn as well. If you wanna ask me any follow-up questions after this conversation here, uh, this is also my Twitter as well. My Twitter handle is at Office Beats. Um, so feel free to reach out at any time. Um, so if you'd like, uh, I'll take these last 15 minutes and people can ask me any questions and I'd love to answer them based on my knowledge or experience. Okay, thank you so much, Ines, too, for that session. So guys, please, if you have any questions, please just drop it on the chat. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'm thinking you can also go ahead to raise your hand and we'll omit you to ask your questions. Okay, I think Bobby, do you have a question because you are omitted. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and ask. And any other person, if you have a question, please just raise your hands. Thank you. I think Bobby just muted. <laughs> Don't get intimidated, guys. You can ask me any question and I, I'll answer any question you have. Nobody has a question? Okay, so um, guys, if you understood for, I think we have a quite number of persons here. So for everyone here, if you understood everything on the slide, you just drop yes. If you don't understand some part, just type in no. So everyone, please just drop either yes or no on the chat now so we can go through it. So if you understood it, yes, thank you, Bobby. So every other person, please drop yours. If you understood, you can just drop it on the chat. If you understood, just drop it on the chat. All right, I see one question came in that I can work with. Okay, so, so at what point are you sure that the product is going to sell well? All right, so that's the, that's, that's the answer that everyone is working towards, right? And so how do I describe this? It depends on the industry. It depends on what your trying to solve out of those four phases, right? So if we go back to, to these four phases, what will sell, it's different at each of these phases, right? So if I use that example of, of like Uber when it first launched, that introduction period is just getting as many people as possible in, in to even try out the service, right? And so to find out, you know, is this going to sell? Uber, to my knowledge, has still not been a profitable company. And that's what most people don't know. It's like the cost of operations is so high for Uber, even though it's been growing so much and majority of the country or the world is using services like Uber or using Uber as a service, it's still not profitable, but people are willing to pay, right? So these dynamics of, you know, oh, I'm a startup. If I can get a hundred thousand users on my product to use it once a week or once a month um, for the next three months, then I can find, an, this is usually where the business side comes in. I can find an investor that will likely is going to be willing to pay a million dollars so that I can keep this business going, but I need those hundred thousand users first. Right. And so that process of that balance of what will sell and what won't, this is when you work with your sales team and you find out, you know, what your clients are willing to pay for, you listen to the objections from them. Like, what are people saying that they said no? Why did they say no? And then as a product manager and the sales team, you can collaborate and start talking about, well, what if we built this? Would this overcome that problem? And then this is you as a product manager asking that question, not the other way around where the sales team says, hey, build it like this and they'll buy it. It's a collaborative approach. It goes both ways because you can't just build everything depending on the size of your engineering team and depending on how much time you have to work with. 
Um, so I, unfortunately, my answer is it depends because there's a lot of businesses, a lot of different products. Um, but if you ever want to follow up and ask me for a, a, a specifics on a type of product um, and a type of market, I could probably drive dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, let me see here. Secondly, what if the dev and the designer isn't reaching a consensus? How can you solve that problem? All right. So this is where, as a product manager, you need to be diplomatic, right? This is where I actually disagree with the statement that you are the CEO of the product. There's no, you, nobody reports to you. So you can't just say, hey, we're doing this because I said so because you report to me. Like that's, that's not a thing ever for product managers. Um, and so the, the answer to, you know, how do you get them to, to work together? You, you listen to each person. So a designer will say, this should be designed this way because these are the issues, blah, blah, blah. You listen and take that in and you will agree or disagree with their assessment, right? High level as a product manager, you're determining, I agree with these for these reasons. Yes, you're right on track. And then the engineer says, no, 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 this won't work for these other reasons. And by the way, the designer needs to redo this whole thing because of ABC. Now you have to talk to them as well and, and talk about what you agree or disagree with them. So you're the diplomatic person of what you're saying. Oh, engineer, actually the designer agrees with you here. Like, I think, I think all of us are in agreement on these things. Let's focus on these right now. And then if there are any must have features as a product manager where you're like, ooh, the engineer doesn't wanna build a designer uh, functionality and I need it. Like, and you're the product manager you're saying, I need it for my product. Like you're representing the product. Designers represent the user, you represent the product and the business and the engineer represents the implementation of the backend and how to get it done. And so you can, by listening and being the friendly person and saying, we're all trying to do our best work, you bring these ideas together. Or I, what I sometimes do is I try to find a way to compromise and get them to agree on a certain set of functionality and then work backwards from there. And then be like, okay, now let's touch the other topics. What about these things? And sometimes you don't do it in one meeting. Sometimes you need this. This takes multiple days sometimes. It, you need multiple conversations back and forth because you sleep on it, you wake up. The engineer, I've had this before. Engineer will tell me, this is impossible. I'll ask him why. We dive deep and I'm kindly asking why. I'm not being a jerk and saying, why not? I'm, I'm saying like, okay, so what, what's the breaking point? Like what's, what's like, which, what are the issues? Maybe we can work around those. And then like at the end of that conversation, there's like no solution. And you know, then the day hits and you're like, okay, we'll, we'll figure this out later. And then the next morning that the engineer sleeps on it, wakes up in the morning, gets first thing in the morning. And they're like, Ernesto, I got a plan. I figured it out. I think I know how we're going to do this. And like, you'll get surprised by just talking. Um, and so that's, that's part of the dynamic there. Um, let's see. So can a product manager and project manager coexist in the same project? And is their task interchangeable? Uh, so one coexist, yes, 100%. Uh, project managers in the world of agile are known as like the scrum masters. Um, and so there is a dynamic in which I'm working the user stories, I'm working the strategy, I'm working what the quarter needs to uh, work on. I'm working, I'm talking to the end users to get that research with the designer, I'm figuring out the designs. Simultaneously, a project manager is making sure that the tasks the engineers committed to is getting done as they said they would. And if there are any issues where they estimated something and it's incorrect midway through the project, the project manager will pull me in and say, hey, Ernesto, by the way, things aren't looking good. And, it's, and the project manager being there is they catch it early become, before it becomes an issue. So they actually pull you while you're doing all your strategic and engineering and design and business stuff. They'll pull you in early and then you can address it the issues that come up within the team before it becomes an actual fire. Um, so yes, they're, they're, they can be a part of the process. I expect them to be. I don't always have a scrum master or project manager available and I have to put the hat on, but when I have it, I, uh, it's a blessing and I actually always appreciate it. Um, apart from the OKR tool you mentioned, is there any other tool a product manager should know and work with? Um, yeah, so the OKR is a, is a framework. There's lots of frameworks. I have a unique uh, perspective on frameworks. Um, they're not very successful for me. When I've tried to use frameworks, the OKR is, is a good one to use because people learn how Google operates as a business. And so executives know what OKRs are. And so I sometimes try to 
build my uh, strategy in OKR format. And then I talk to people individually on the leadership team and I'll say, hey, like I'm trying to come up with a long-term strategy, how to articulate it. Have you heard of OKRs? And if they, and if half the leadership team says yes, then I, I hit the ground running and I use OKRs. If the team has never heard of OKRs, I don't use them, right? I, I pivot and I figure another way. I talk to them and I find out, okay, what, what resonates with you? How have you seen the strategy over product done? Um, and then I figure it out. So like, I would say I've, I've used OKRs only about 25% of all my products. And then I've just used different versions or different ways of articulating the same type of thing. Um, OKRs and other frameworks are basically achieving two things. One, there's a cohesive set of objectives or goals that the business has. And the business needs this just to be a business in the first place. And then you're just trying to find out how to measure success for each of those from a technology and product perspective. Um, and so whether you call it OKRs, whether you call it OGSM, where whatever the acronyms are, they're all achieving that. And so as long as you get those deliverables, that output, you're, you're good to go. And many people use multiple frameworks together. So yeah, um, I use one called OGSM. There's another one called circles to be part of the process of how you solve problems. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, material out there on the internet for that. And if you want to ask me directly, I can, I can send you some links. Uh, for the product life cycle, sometimes I see five stages, including development. So I want to know if, this, if that is a stage where the idea is developed. Also, what are the stages we have from the ideation stage to the development phase? Okay, so these are the four phases of a product life cycle. Uh, it sounds like you're asking more about the product development life cycle, which is different. So a product life cycle is like the beginning of when a product is just getting introduced to the market. There's a growth phase, maturity and decline. Um, what you're talking about, it's a, more of like the agile product development life cycle. Um, and I think there's another Zoom meeting uh, that somebody else will be talking on that touch point about ideation to development. There's a lot of ways of doing that. Personally, um, that ideation to development phase, I like to use the Google Ventures design sprint process. There is a book called uh, Sprint by Jake Knapp. Um, and that is a really good book that articulates a great format that a lot of companies borrow or use their versions of to do that ideation stage two development. Um, let me see here. What do you do as a product manager if your initial assumptions are proved wrong while interviewing users and trying to validate the assumptions from the user's perspective? Yeah, so I have been there before um, where you, you get a lot of insights. You're, you're finding out that your original plan was wrong. I will say one thing. People don't care if you're, if, who was right and who was wrong. At the end of the day, the business needs to survive. The business, the business needs to grow and needs to make revenue and needs to grow, grow in users and get adoption. And so whether or not you as an individual were wrong, it doesn't matter. Like what matters is that when you heard that information that it says you're, you're, something's going wrong, are you immediately coming up with a way of alternative solutions or alternative plans or next steps to find out what would be right? Um, and, and CEOs and founders will appreciate you for that because they will assume if they've done, if they've built more than one business before, they know people are going to be wrong. Like more, more than likely they've been wrong half the time and that's fine, but they pivoted fast enough and they find out what to do right after all fast enough before you get those pains of it costing the business too much. Um, so yeah, I would say when that happens, you need to be the person that comes up with the alternative. You can't just say, oh, this is my hypothesis. You talk to users and then you find out it's wrong. And then you just say, well, I was wrong, sorry. Like, no, no, like you need to, what is the right path then? Like you need to come up with that plan. And it's not on your own, right? This is with the designer and the engineering team. So it's not a, a solo project. You need to do this with the whole team. At a point you mentioned that a company would prefer to employ a product manager who has driven a product to success as a new product manager who has little or no experience. How can we convince potential clients then? So if, if you've never done product before um, or you're brand new and just got training, what you, I mean, there's various ways, various ways to go about it. The, the easier approach is to be hired on as an associate product manager. So you're working along another product manager. And so typically, I mean, everything I just mentioned is a very busy week and you usually don't have, you're not working only eight hours. Sometimes you do a full night, all nighter into the next day, right? Like, 
And so pulling in an associate product manager is very helpful because the, now a seasoned product manager will tell you, I need this and I need that. And these are the things I've done already. Um, this is what I need next. And they'll guide you through that path. Now you mentioned, how can we convince potential clients? Um, I don't understand that question um, so well. So maybe you can ask a follow-up question about that potential clients, convincing potential clients, um, unless like you're trying to do a consulting approach. I'm not sure. Um, how can an entry-level PM get in? Okay, how, how and where can we get internships or entry-level jobs to develop and sharpen skills and can PM work remotely? Uh, yes, uh, remote, remote PMing is, a, is very viable. Um, especially specifically if the rest of the team is remote. Um, if hybrid can work as well, uh, I currently work in a hybrid environment. Um, and your question here is you were saying, uh, how can an entry level PM get in? I stumbled into product management. So even though I showed those first two products, the tablet, the touchscreen devices, I was an IT support person for that company, right? So I wasn't hired as a product manager. I was hired as an IT support with former customer service experience on their existing product. And then um, six months into the job, I was doing really good. Um, and then the CEO announced to the company excitedly that he wanted to launch tablets into the exam room with touchscreen uh, devices. Um, and he hired a, a director of engineering to get that started. And I volunteered free time of my own after hours from, I would work eight, eight to five, my regular job. And then from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., I was dedicating three hours a day to work as a passion project for free for that job. I was getting paid for my day job. So I wasn't doing for free 100%. They were paying me for my day job, eight to five. But I, was just, I would just donate this five to eight to helping them figure out how to, how to launch. And I was working with that director of engineering. So one thing I would say is if you have an existing job, find out if they have an IT team and if they have like a product team or you know, talk to the founder or CEO if it's a small enough company. And that's how I did it. Like I expressed interest, passion, interest, and willing to do it for free. That's my first time doing it. And people will usually take you up on it. Now, if you don't, if you want to get paid as part of that process, yes, there's a lot of internships uh, possible out there. I know a lot of the major companies, I know BCG itself, um, if anybody wants to, uh, wants to follow up with me on LinkedIn, I know we do have internships, product management internships. Um, and, and there's big, the, the bigger companies tend to offer those services. And so there's, there's ways to go about that as well. And I, I assume top universe also helps out with that process. Um, how do you bring products in the client stage back to life as a product manager? I understand you will have to create new great features, but what strategies or how do you make people fall in love with the product again? And we'll get... so sometimes it, it's a rebranding scenario. Um, Typically, if, if you want to bring something back to life um, that has already been out in the market for many years, you may have to change it, um, the branding, I should say, like even or even the name of it. So in order to accomplish a rebrand uh, scenario, you need to deliver net new value that was not there at the same time as the rebrand, right? And so, and it's not just a logo change and a name change, right? So... Um, I think maybe that, that best example that I used earlier, right, is like Microsoft had Skype. That's the, that was their product. And then they launched Teams. But like when they launched Teams, it did not have the same exact functionality. It, it was totally different in the interface. But the back end infrastructure, I'm sure, is like 90% the same um, that they carried over for the, you know, the WebEx type of conversation. So with that said, you know, it's a combination of rebranding um, and also making sure that your product features that you launch with that rebrand are sticky so that people don't ask themselves, wait, is this like when you're using Teams, you're not asking yourself, wait, is this Skype, but just like reskinned? Like it doesn't feel that way. You're not as a user, you're not asking that. You're just like, oh, Teams is just like, it's like what I need to use for work. And like, and it doesn't, all of a sudden you forget the old product, but guess what? Microsoft is financing the marketing of teams behind the scenes, right? Um, so that's just a quick example that I can give in the moment, just top of my mind right now of how that could work. Uh, but typically it's a rebrand initiative to kind of get, get it back into place if it's, if it's gone too deep on the decline phase. Uh, all right, 
looks like those are all the questions. We're, we're at time. So, uh, Emanuela, let me know if there's anything else you want me to help with or explain. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ernesto, for that. Yeah. Guys, if you have any other question, you can drop it on chat. And also, I dropped Ernesto's LinkedIn profile on the chat. So, guys, please give him a follow on LinkedIn and also on Twitter. So please check the chat and click on the link and you take it directly to LinkedIn. And please follow him up on LinkedIn and you can also reach out to him if you have any other question or if you need more insight into product management. And also it's also going to be taking us more next week. We also have a class with him. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ernesto. Thank you. Yes, so no guys, problem. you can drop your like you can drop messages on the group. Okay, yeah, someone just said she followed you already. Okay, mm, thank you. Ms. Amaka, yeah, Ms. Amaka, please, you have anything to add? Thank you. No, nothing much. Just thank you, Ernesto, for coming on this call. I learned a whole lot today. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I love to collaborate. And just like I mentioned previously, I love to help the uh, Black and Latinx community. We need to work together to help each other in our careers grow. So thank you, everyone, for joining and listening. And if I can help any other time, let me know. I'd love to, to help anyone else. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. See you all. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Okay, bye, guys.